Good evening and welcome to Darker Days Radio. And tonight is going to be a Darkly number 37, where myself, Mike, and my uh, wonderful co-host, Chig, should discuss Revelations of the Dark Mother. Evening, everybody. Well, Chig, before we get started on this very phenomenal book, how are you? Doing all right, Mike. How about yourself? Not bad, not bad. Uh, how has your uh, gaming been? It's been quite some time since we last recorded. Uh, my gaming has been sporadic. Uh, real life keeps getting in the way of my gaming group, uh, but um, I have been doing some play-by-post gaming on the internet. Oh, oh, Chig, I'm I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know. It's like it's like gaming methadone. You know, it's it's better than nothing, but, but it's not just the real barely. Thing. But just barely. Very good, Chig. Very good. Well, uh, my own Exalted game has been, you know, going pretty decently, and uh, I'm very happy with that. And uh, the characters just made their way to the uh, southern city of Chio Rescuro, so that's going to be very exciting for the uh, game itself. Is that where they make uh, delicious meat on a stick? Uh, they do. They also make a uh, very strong form of glass, which uh, the recipe to has been essentially lost since the uh, fall of the First Age. Except they make it, so I guess they found the recipe? No, I don't think they do, but there's a recipe printed in one of the books, so, you know, it's a thing. Oh, well. Yep. Yep, totally. There you go, then. Yeah, cool. So, Chig, let's talk about this book. Let's just dive right into it for this Darkling show. What is Revelations of the Dark Mother? Why, why is it so notable amongst the, uh, amongst the Vampire the Masquerade line? It is a great book above and beyond anything else it is a a fantastic uh uh in world supplement uh that shows uh basically a holy book compilation much like the uh the book of nod except for for a much much smaller group of vampires the uh the bahari the followers of lilith Indeed, Trig, indeed. And it's quite notable because, unlike the uh, Book of Nod, it's an actual um, vanity press book. That's the actual form that's supposed to take uh, within the World of Darkness world, where this one uh, Bahari follower has become so fed up with, uh, well, the society around her that she literally printed up 10,000 copies and just put them out there in bookstores which is uh, a little bit different than, say, the Silver Record or the, uh, the Book of Nod. Um, but yes, uh, Revelations of the Dark Mother is also quite interesting because it, it definitely takes a different form and tone than the uh, Book of Nod and the uh, Ursius fragments from the uh, Dark Edges line. And uh, I think we'll explore that a little bit here tonight. Uh, but Chig, what can you tell us about the, uh, or how do you feel about the author of this book, the uh, woman that compiled it? Um, well, she's a little intense, just a, a, a smidge, but that's to be expected for any religious fanatic, uh, like she's supposed to be. Um, she's an interesting character. Does it, does it ever actually give her name? Yes, it does. Uh, she, does cause it? she's the author on the author page. It's ah, Rachel, Rachel Dolium. Dolium, which right might be a Vitas card page. as well. But, uh, yeah, she is a little intense. Uh, I would say that uh, I didn't really appreciate her uh, in the uh, kind of intro section where she's just talking about what it means to be a Bahari and all that, you know, the kind of intensity that she brings. Uh, but later on in the footnotes, that's where the character really comes alive and uh, displays some very interesting uh, opinions and information, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. I do enjoy a good, uh, good footnote and endnote in a book. Indeed. And uh, I should also note that this is really a very good uh, uh, example of the gothic puck element of the classic World of Darkness, uh, wherein uh, you have this very gothic text, which is uh, these uh, different uh, scriptures discussing Lilith, uh, but you also have this very uh, modern punk author who's describing everything to you. And in this case, it really does work, I feel, especially when you get into the footnotes. Uh, and uh, it gives you a good feel for the, how you should present the Vampire the Masquerade setting uh, as such. Indeed, and, and also uh, the composition of the, the actual uh, fragments in the book, which range from 
uh, you know, very biblical sounding fragments of uh, scripture up to uh, toward the end, you know, uh, rock and roll song lyrics is a, uh, it's a very, very nice um, compilation showing that you can just, you know, draw inspiration from all over for your, your crazy religion. Let's just kind of jump right into it and first discuss what the Bihari are um, before we get into the actual text and what's presented in the book. Um, so when you look at very early Vampire the Masquerade, uh, specifically if you uh, check out Dirty Secrets of the Black Hand uh, and also some of the early Sabat books, they'll talk about Lilith and the Lilins, spelled L-I-L-I-N-S. Uh, and that's really the form that the uh, early uh, Lilith cult takes the form of. Uh, in uh, Vampire the Masquerade. But they sort of do away with that. They kind of push that to the side. I think especially when they get to the Dark Ages and they start to introduce the uh, Lamia bloodline. And then uh, following that, kind of out of left field is where we get this book, where we get Revelations of the Dark Mother, which introduces a new faction, uh, the Bahari themselves. And it's notable because it doesn't tie too much into the uh, earlier writings. And it's not really referenced after uh, in Vampire the Masquerade. That's why it's kind of just this this unique book that stands by itself. Yeah, I, I, if I had to, to point to one major flaw in uh, Vampire the Masquerade, it's the, uh, the huge monolithic vampire factions and not a lot else going on. You have the, uh, you have the Camarilla, you have the Sabbat, you have a couple of minor clans who were their own little thing like the giovanni and the uh the the ravnos but you don't have a lot of minor smaller groups uh there are the uh everybody's favorite um what are they the uh the children of the cyrus <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. and uh the uh the the bahari here but they really don't get much play outside of a single book each, which I found, which I think is a, a huge wasted opportunity. Well, it's interesting. When you look at the uh, revised line for Vampire the Masquerade, they do try to introduce uh, some minor factions, that sort of thing. But they're always, you know, sub factions or uh, within the sects of uh, uh, the Camarilla Sabbat and the Anarchs. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned, the uh, Jersey Sick is the Black Hand, the Tal Mahara, um, kind of fell to the wayside and revised, unfortunately. So, yes, uh, you are quite correct, sir, in that there is not really, the, not really enough independent, uh, unique factions within Vampire the Masquerade. Um, and even now with the V20 line, they haven't explored that too much. No, they they really haven't. But uh, you know, now that they are not having to do their supplement treadmill, maybe they'll get that opportunity. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. But anyway, let's dig into the text itself. So uh, much like the Book of Nod, um, Revelations of the Dark Mother is a compilation of uh, scriptures almost. Um, but quite unlike the Book of Nod, it has a much more coherent and cohesive. Uh, narrative throughout. There's not as much jumping around from page to page, different styles. Um, the uh, author of this book, uh, in the real world, being uh, Seder Phil Brucato, uh, put a lot of effort into uh, making it, uh, giving the text a, a cohesive but still archaic feel. Uh, and really, the only major differences are in between the different chapters. So the uh, Book of the Serpent, Book of the Dragon, and Book of the Owl. Yes, correct. Not in that order. No, I, I did uh, misorder them. But anyway, let's let's kind of dig into the Book of the Serpent a little bit, which I found to be definitely the most intriguing of the three. Um, what it essentially tells, much like the Book of Nod, is a story of creation. But in this case, primarily from the uh, eyes of Lilith, who is uh, Adam's first wife uh, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, she was made uh, to be equal to, uh, to Adam, uh, both from the same earth. And uh, she, as an equal, did not want to become subservient to Adam. And that essentially caused the uh, conflict between them. 
um, Lilith was eventually uh, taken up to heaven and uh, became the consort of Yahweh uh, and was then cast out for some reason, actually. It's not very clear uh, in particular why. Um, maybe they kind of left that blank. Uh, perhaps she herself wanted to not be an equal or subservient to a deity either. Yeah, it's kind uh, of actually, I think that's that definitely... she was cast out due to her, um, her headstrong womanness, girl powerness. Indeed. Uh, and because she uh, ate some fruit from the uh, tree of knowledge and the tree of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, she essentially became immortal herself, uh, which is why she feels that she should not be subservient to any deities. Um, going through as her exploring the world, uh, going into the sea and becoming the uh, mother of many different uh, monsters uh, down at the bottom of the ocean and the endless sea itself, uh, she of course, eventually heads back to uh, Eden and meets a uh, particular shining one, uh, essentially an angel, or actually, well, uh, an Elohim. It it, it Hmm? says angel. It does, it does. Uh, But it also refers to them as Elohim, uh, which we should probably discuss in a second uh, after after going over the basic story. Uh, She impresses uh, Lucifer quite a bit and uh, receives a cloak of night. Uh, which gives her many powers and abilities to travel unseen. So after receiving the uh, Cloak of Night, uh, Lilith uh, enters the Garden again, uh, Garden of Eden, and convinces Adam and Eve, actually in particular, uh, to consume uh, fruit from the Tree of Knowledge, which, of course, causes everything to be messed up. Uh, Yahweh the Deity destroys his garden, and uh, the other Shining Ones kind of just look upon uh, the disaster and sort of part ways, which is an interesting note that uh, the angels seem to be far more um, independent uh, than uh, the the Christian Bible would say portray them as. They also make Uh, uh, Jehovah a much bigger baby about things in this than the Christian Bible obviously makes him. He, he, uh, indeed. Has, he has indeed. tantrums, he gets upset a lot, he he kicks people out. He's just kind of a kind of a jerky jerk guy. Well, no, I think that's actually quite accurate, uh, <laughs> when you look at uh the the Old Testament in particular, and that uh he's a deity that uh is very prone to tantrums and uh, does does some very odd things. Uh, there's actually some very interesting notes in this book uh, from a storytelling standpoint, which uh, do jive extremely well with uh, the uh, Genesis book of the, uh, of the Bible. Uh, in particular, uh, there is note that uh, prior to Lilith, uh, Yahweh actually had a, uh, another consort, uh, perhaps one of the Elohim, uh, which actually is reflected, uh, if you go and read the book of Genesis, in there. Uh, there are some hints that he may have had a wife. Uh, and indeed, there's a very good discussion in the footnotes, and this is one of the things I love, uh, where it discusses really the definition of, of Elohim uh, as to whether it's angels or other gods, like uh, other pantheons that uh, Yahweh would be uh, uh, meeting with or discussing things with. If you go and look at the other White Wolf game, Demon the Fallen, that one in particular kind of runs with the whole idea of the Elohim uh, being angels, but also being somewhat independent and causing, of course, the uh, the war in heaven. That is a uh, major historical backdrop to that setting. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Lucifer has kind of a large role in the Demon the Fallen game as well, right? Well, he was their leader. And they they now... mentioned him a time or two, I'm saying here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Once or twice. Definitely. Yep. So, uh, yeah, Demon the Fallen is very notable for uh, how it was able to tie together all the different World of Darkness games uh, in, a, in a pretty decent way. Uh, so that's something we'll have to explore here on the show uh, in the future. But getting back to Revelations of the Dark Mother... Um, so that's essentially kind of the creation of Lilith as, as a... Uh, as... I guess you could say a deity or um, as a, a cult leader um, to that point. Uh, she creates her own garden and uh, there uh, 
is able to uh, create her own creatures, which can only thrive in her soil and with the uh, light of the moon, which was a uh, very intriguing image uh, that the author presented. And uh, here she lives or resides with Lucifer uh, and has her uh, various uh, meetings with different people, different shining ones, and then eventually uh, she meets Cain. And this is really the only time in the book that uh, the Lilith story actually intersects with uh, the, the story of Vampire the Masquerade, the uh, Cain mythology and backstory. Uh, and it's somewhat similar to um, the, the story told in the Book of Nod, except that Lilith is far less friendly, if you will. Uh, she definitely uh, teaches Cain uh, many disciplines, but in a very different manner than is presented in uh, the Book of Nod. She uh, really tortures him and uh, puts him through many uh, challenges uh, well, to hopefully make him stronger. Now, we, we, you're, you're skipping ahead here to the Book of the Owl, because I don't think Cain shows up in the, uh, the first book. The book of uh, the you are correct. You are correct. I, I did skip ahead. So, for those following along at home, Mike is skipping ahead. <laughs> uh, a little bit, but uh, yeah. Yes. The, the uh, book, so, so the book, book, book not, of the book of the servant is not really in chronological order. Much like actual uh, real world religious stuff, it skips back and forth and forth and back, which is another uh, nice little touch. Uh, indeed, indeed. But the book of the sermon really ends with uh, the destruction of Garden of Eden and Lilith going uh, off to create her own garden. Uh, and sort of picks up with her wandering around, exploring, going back to the sea for a bit, and then finally coming back and uh, destroying or uh, creating her own garden. Um, <clears throat> so pretty much um, the, the book seems to make this claim that uh, Lilith's almost torture uh, uh, strengthens Cain uh, to stand against the, uh, the reproachments of uh, the three angels, uh, just like in the Book of Nod. And eventually... Realizing that he's quite damned, he uh, leaves Lilith uh, and is quite unhappy with her and goes off to create his own brood of, of vampires. Uh, for a time, it's good. Lilith gets to enjoy her garden, has some children with Lucifer. It's a pretty rad time until Cain comes back. And uh, he, along with 13 vampires, we assume the uh, 13 antediluvians, uh, goes and uh, destroys, attacks and destroys Lilith's garden, uh, turning it all to ash. Uh, this is kind of interesting simply because it leaves out uh, the three uh, second, second generation, generation vampires. vampires. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so those are kind of left out and are not um, not mentioned or present. Uh, there's a good, pretty good uh, footnote discussion of that. And there's actually kind of a cool uh, uh, segment where basically Lilith calls out these uh, many different uh, clan founders uh, and pretty much curses all of them except for two, which are the uh, uh, progenitor of the Toreador and the Nosferatu, since those two are the only ones to uh, show any compassion to her children. Kind of neat. Kind of, I liked it. Yeah, I, I like that uh, the uh, the cursing of the clans comes not from Cain in this mythos, but uh, but from Lilith. Because in, in traditional Cainite lore, it all comes from Cain. Yes, uh, I'm not really sure if that's in particular where the clan flaws were supposed to come from, but, you know, well, it's a cool idea to go with. What curse are they going to have? Don't know, dude. Don't know. Yeah, but see, anyway, see, totally. Uh, yes, but the uh, the destruction of the uh, of the garden really kind of closes out the uh, uh, book of the owl. Uh, there's some interesting rites of Cain and uh, different uh, sort of rituals that are written up here, uh, which could be pretty cool to actually just use in your game. It kind of gives you a framework uh, to run a scene and describe to your players. Which yeah, as long is, as you're not uh, larping, kinda... some of these sound like they might be interesting. Yeah, it might be hard to uh, do in a uh, very, um, how should I say this, convincing manner in a LARP without, you know, involving real blood. Yeah. Sweet. And then we get to the uh, Book of the Dragon. So, Chig, what's in here? What's in the Book of the Dragon? Uh, the Book of the Dragon is the final uh, chapter, verse, 
circle, whatever they call it, of the uh, of the book. Um, it contains uh, uh, what happened to the Lamia, which uh, were a, a fun little sub clan back in the Dark Ages. Um, mm-hmm. It has uh, a section called "The Queen of Hells," which is a, a nice little lyrical poem about Lilith. Uh, let's see. It has it has a little a couple poem slash song things in it. Um, maybe a um, what's what I'm looking for here? A um, not um, dang. What's what I'm looking for here? Like a like a. Uh, curse or a um a vision of the future yes there's a very uh eschatological uh uh, verse or or poem at the very end the rising tide and that's something interesting that we should definitely uh just talk about a little bit it's not as uh dripping with ideas as say the uh, final book of the book of nod is um which tells you about the time of thin blood uh last daughter of eve and all these other very interesting uh, plot points. It's kind of a vague sort of threat uh, to canites themselves. Uh, well, discussing not, not a... just to canites, but to everybody. Because one of the things about this book is that not all of the Bahari are vampires. In fact, the majority of them are not vampires. Mm, mm, indeed. No, you're quite right. Um, but... This is an interesting uh, sort of sort of uh, as I mentioned, uh, doomsday uh, prophetic uh, poem. That's what I was looking for. A prophecy, indeed. In which case, uh, what was it say? Lilith is here. Lilith is free. Um, and she she not comes happy back. With what you have done, indeed, uh, to claim the world as her own. And this is kind of cool because it ties into uh, what is probably most definitely the weakest of the uh, four Gehenna scenarios in the uh, Gehenna source book for Vampire the Masquerade. But uh, it's pretty neat that uh, when they were writing that source book, they went back and said, you know, of our four scenarios that we're going to do, let's take a look at Revelations of the Dark Mother and uh, kind of tie that in. Uh, so that's the uh, the fair is foul uh, scenario itself. And in that one, Lilith comes back and pretty much has a back alley brawl with Kane. Um, I'm not sure if I should have said spoiler alert right there, but that's pretty much what happens. Uh, and Can there really is a... spoil a book that is meant to be multiple choice, choose your own ending kind of thing? Uh, as long as your storyteller yeah. doesn't say, okay, we're running, uh, we're running this particular scenario from the book, then it's, you can't really spoil it. Cause listen, I, I would love to hear if anyone ever ran fair as foul because it's not a very good scenario. <laughs> it's literally, it's literally Kane's like, Oh, Oh snap. Lilith's back. Uh, I'm going to need to go find a couple antediluvians and then recruit this one coterie of vampires, which happens to be your player characters to have a back alley brawl with Lilith and her group of antediluvians. Uh, I will note that uh, there is a there's a really cool uh, idea in there that Lilith goes and creates a second garden for herself, and that's kind of where she's been for the last however however many millennia. Uh, and there, she gathered a bunch of uh, antediluvians who probably didn't create any clans. Maybe they made some bloodlines, but uh, for example, like she gets uh, uh, Nosferatu's brother, who is not terrible looking. John Ferratu. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, grabs a few other uh, antediluvians to kind of uh, gather there. And that's a little lame that there's like all these other antediluvians that were just sitting around and she, she picks up. Well, I think it would have been way, way cooler and more interesting if essentially she grabbed a bunch of elder vampires to her cause to become Bahari. And these vampires who sort of step away from the uh the jihad and the 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 masquerade well the the endless politics of the kindred were actually basically the the founders of the Inkanu. so the Inkanu the entire time you wonder what they're supposed to be doing it wasn't really searching for galkanda they were just kind of biding their time and supporting lilith and uh you find out in the final nights that they are uh in fact the uh these bahari followers of of lilith who then returns 
Well, there's no reason that you couldn't fold those into the scenario. Yeah, absolutely. No, you could easily do that. Uh, and maybe. I think that would help strengthen it quite a bit. And also maybe. get rid of the back alley brawl. Cause maybe, that's, maybe that's why the Inkanu have been uh, manipulating the Camarilla and the Sabat. You know, it's the uh, the fire that they have to forge all of the uh, the best and the brightest and get them, you know, once they reach a certain level, they can pull them out of that and say, okay, here's the real truth. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. And then they can join the so, Inkanu. It's like a, a vampire secret society kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, kind of a cool way to run it. But uh, Chig, looking at Revelations of the Dark Mother, it's got a little bit of Vampire the Masquerade in there, but it's really not a vampire book, is it? It really, really isn't. Um, I can see the Revelations of the Dark Mother uh, working as a very dark and twisted uh, paradigm for a uh, Verbena from the Mage uh, game. Or maybe even a um, in the Changeling game. You could have some, some really unpleasant Changelings who are followers of Lilith. Hmm. And who are all into, you know, blood rites and sacrifice and all that to to bring back the spring or to prevent the oncoming winter. Um, it can, I cannot think off the top of my head, maybe Wraith, of a uh, a single Old World of Darkness game that couldn't incorporate uh, the Bahari faction as some kind of dark and twisted group within the groups. Indeed, uh, Lilith could make a very good uh, alternate personification of Gaia in uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse, where when she's gifted uh, the basically sun the, or moon of the stars, uh, has a very interesting tie-in to uh, Luna and uh, the shapeshifters themselves. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, but I kind of really like my personal idea of um, uh, what's his name. The uh, the one the the antediluvian who who melded into the earth. Oh, uh, and Anoya, the uh, Gangrel antediluvian. Yeah, An- Anoya. That's the one I can never remember. Remember their name. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of I kind of like my idea that uh, as long as Anoya has melded into the earth, that uh, Gaia herself has been corrupted by the the vampiric presence, and that until mm-hmm. the werewolves figure point. figure that out and get that and anti- get that clan founder antediluvian out of there they're fighting a battle they can never hope of getting a, a strong foothold in hmm. and you know chick you know there's a great tie-in with world of darkness gypsies i know i already mentioned this on the show way back when when we went over that uh very questionable source book but uh the founder of uh the uh uh how do I say this without making it seem really racist? Uh, note that this was all done written by White Wolf. Uh, the founder of the Romani bloodline culture tribe something um, herself uh, consumed a uh, forbidden fruit uh, a, from a, a tree of knowledge, if you will. And uh, this gave her magical powers, which passed down to her, her bloodline. Um so it, it provides really a very interesting parallel story uh, to what's presented in Revelations of the Dark Mother. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially since uh, Lilith had her own garden that she tended with the seeds that she carried out of uh, Eden. So she had her own little forbidden fruit trees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's Revelation as a Dark Mother right there. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Do we have anything else we need to uh, talk about with regard to this book, Chig? Um, I only, yeah, I only wish that they had done more with it. That it had, uh, it, it, uh, it didn't come out early enough in the run, I think, for it to have a lot of uh, impact on the game. Well, it came out in 98, so I guess it could have done more with it than they did. Mm. Yeah, mm. I, I mostly just wish that it had had a, a larger impact on the game. Because there's there's a yeah, ton of great ideas in here that you can steal or borrow for any any old World of Darkness game, or maybe yeah, even the totally. new World of Darkness. I don't know. Absolutely, Circle of the Crone could make uh, 
could get quite a bit of mileage out of this book. Um, actually, actually, Changeling the Lost has a lot of very intriguing parallels, doesn't it? Uh, both with uh, how how you know uh, going beyond the hedge and ending up in this very torturous realm uh, is very much like what uh, Lilith did to Cain in this source book. Mm-hmm. Kidnapped mm-hmm. him, changed him around quite a lot, taught him some new tricks and exciting things he can do, and uh, after a while sent him back on his way. Forever oh, jeez, and Chig, Chig, Chig. Think of all the uh, sea monsters that Lilith created. Is there a tie-in there? Is there a tie-in with Blood Dim Tides? There must be. There's always a tie-in with Blood Dim Tides. That is the beauty of the book, Blood Dim Tides. Indeed. Indeed. Cool. So, uh, I think that's it. Jig, do you, do you want to talk about anything else, like in general? Um, yeah, it's it's a really, really short book, unfortunately. So, there's not a lot. You can get a lot of mileage out of it, and we've really only barely scratched the surface here just going over it. Um, but uh, if you haven't read it yet, I highly suggest picking it up reading it. It's You can read it in an afternoon, but it is a, a super fun book with a lot of fun ideas in it for your given Sweet. dark and twisted values of fun. <laughs> is it available on absolutely. drive-thru? Surely it's on drive-thru. Totally. Okay. It yeah. definitely is. Awesome. All right, Chig. Well, I guess that's it. So uh, thank you very much. Hey, and uh, we'll be back soon with Chris back on the show. He just moved uh, back to the United Kingdom. And uh, he's pretty excited to talk about Werewolf the Forsaken, second edition. And I guess that's it. Thank you, very everyone. And uh, have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so what we're, we're going to go uh, 37. All right, we're going to go re-live in 3, in two, 1. What? 37? What are we talking about? Have you never seen Clerks? Yeah. That's how many dicks she sucked. In a row? Exactly! <laughs> oh, good thing we just <laughs> recorded that. <laughs> and that's the after show. <laughs> <laughs>